Welcome to Sounds of Brass. All in a day's work. 30 years as a local Bobby by Chris Helm. Chapter 7. A new start. I was back at home now, but I didn't have a job. As I laid in bed a couple of days after finishing in Leeds, I thought, what am I going to do now? As the days went by, I was quite naturally starting to get a little bit of pressure at home to find a job. After five weeks, I was beginning to feel the pinch, with not a lot of money left. Where do you get money from when you're out of work? The Dole Office, as we called it in those days. I presented myself at Pellico House, which was in Birdsroyd Lane, Brick House. These days it is multi-occupation business premises. Back in the early 1970s, it was the town's Department of Health and Social Security Office, otherwise known as the Dole Office. I went inside and walked to the front desk. "'Can I help you?' said a middle-aged man. He spoke in a boring, monotone voice, the kind which suggested to me that he really didn't want to be there. It displayed a blank facial expression, giving nothing away. There was not even a welcoming smile. Did he really want to help me? "'Yes,' I said. "'I have no job, and I need some money.' "'Why do you have no job?' he asked. "'I packed it in because I didn't like it.' "'This was somewhat naive, thinking about it now. "'The man looked at me for a few moments "'before replying in a slow, drawling kind of way, "'So you had a job, and because you didn't like it, "'you decided to leave on your own accord? "'You weren't dismissed? "'No. "'Have you tried to get another job? "'Er, uh, no, not yet.' "'Let me give you some advice,' he said. "'Have you got any money at all?' "'Well,' I began, "'all I have are some premium bonds "'that my mum and dad bought me for my twenty-first birthday.' "'Hmm, how many did they buy you?' he asked. Twenty-one. "'When you have spent those, come back and we will see what we can do.' "'It was obvious that he meant I wasn't going to get any money. "'I would have to get a job.' I remember being at St. Martin's during my last year when the careers officer came and asked all the lads where we wanted to work. He gave us the choice of either Firth Carpets or Blakeborough Valves. But I always wanted to join the police. My childhood ambition had been and gone, and it was now time to look seriously at the two options that were offered to me all those years ago. I wasn't, and I'm still not the hands-on DIY type of person, and I don't really like to get my hands dirty. And, as someone once said, Blakebury's is a muck hole. So I felt that Blakebury's was not the place for me. Having worked in the office in Halifax before joining the police, I felt that I was probably best suited to office work. The Brighouse Echo always advertised plenty of jobs in the early 1970s, and with Firth being a major employer, I was soon able to find a position there in the vacancy section. Back in the early 1970s, you could pack your job in on a Friday, check out all the vacancies in that week's Echo, and choose from at least half a dozen and get a new start on the Monday. An alternative was to walk the full length of Birdsroyd Lane, down to the industrial estate and check out the situation vacant signboards outside the mill and factory buildings. How times have changed. Not only have the signboards gone, but most of the mills and factories have as well. And you can almost strain your eyes looking for a job in the Echo. Applying for a job at Firth's meant I had to see a young chap in the personnel department. Little did I know that I would see him many more times in later years. This was when he was the personnel manager and needed some help or advice from the local police, which, by that time, would be yours truly. I was successful at the interview and he gave me a job working in the Tufting Department office. I was working with some great people, but I soon began to find that the job was not for me. After working on my own on the streets of Leeds, 
After being confined to the fishbowl atmosphere of the office for three months, I decided to leave. Looking back, I felt that I'd handed in my notice just in the nick of time. They were about to get rid of me. I can still say that I was never sacked from a job during the whole of my working life. After leaving Firths, I was back looking for a job, and I applied to a company in Bradford that sold novelties for the seaside amusement industry. The company also sold novelties that were often given out as prizes at annual fetes and galas, and also provided the mystery prizes that kids liked to pull out of brand tubs or tried to win on fairground stalls. I was working with a great bunch of lads, although some of them treated me with a little bit of suspicion once they knew I'd been in the police. Within days, I knew that working in a warehouse was not the job for me. Arriving for work one morning, during the last week at the company, I was sent for by the boss. He took me to an office where I was introduced to some members of the Bradford CID. The detective sitting in the boss's chair was a smart, dapper-looking chap with a pencil-styled moustache. He was wearing a very smart suit and an ex-serviceman's tie. He reminded me of the actor Raymond Francis, better known to some as Detective Chief Superintendent Tom Lockhart, from the 1960s TV series No Hiding Place. "'Hello, Chris,' he said. "'I'm from Bradford CID, and I'm a detective inspector. "'We are here to investigate the theft of some stock from the premises. "'I understand you used to be in the police.' "'Yes, that's right, sir,' I said. I have a view that anyone who has served in the police for however long is a certain kind of person. Once a policeman, always a policeman. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Do you think I have something to do with these thefts? I asked. No, we don't. But we would like to speak to you about what has been going on. The interview lasted almost an hour. I met the detective inspector again many years later after I had transferred to Brick House. One of his investigations involved a prisoner of mine. After we chatted for a few minutes about our previous encounter, he was soon off back to the big city and bright lights of Bradford. Once I left the warehouse work, I was beginning to have thoughts of rejoining the police. Would it be possible to do this? I wasn't sacked from Leeds, and the certificate they sent me after I left pointed out that I had resigned from the police with an unblemished character. In April 1972, I became PC 539 in the Bradford City Police. I was given just one year to serve as a probationer, having served one year already in Leeds. I was posted to Odsall Division, working in the Wyke and Low Moor areas, and based at the section box, which was next to the Wyke Library. Although I still didn't have a car, getting to Wyke for early turn wasn't a problem, even on one of the dreaded quick changeover shifts. I worked from the section box with a small group of officers. Four were beat car drivers, but I was one of the six-foot patrol officers. One day a week, probationers had to attend classes at Bolin Road, where the traffic department, control room and various other administrative departments were all based. There was also a door that said band room on it. Did they have a band? This was something I had to investigate. On my first few visits to the weekly classes, I saw some of the probationers who I remembered meeting at the training college in Harrogate. On Thursday, 9th of November, 1972, the lives of the people of Bailiff Bridge would be suddenly changed forever. The day started well for me. I was happy now because I, at last, had the job I always wanted and I felt my life was finally back on track. I left home at lunchtime and walked down Wakefield Road into Bailiff Bridge to catch the 64 bus to Bradford for my weekly class at Bolin Road. I was in good time. There was certainly no need to rush and no sense of urgency. I suppose I would have been halfway down the hill into Bailiff Bridge when I saw a large crowd of people standing in the road, causing traffic to back up in Wakefield Road. Oh no, not again, was my first thought. I knew there had been some major roadworks in the village that had started way back in 1968 after the village had been flooded that summer. 
the improvements to the crossroads seem to have almost been continuous since then, in an effort to reduce the chances of the village being flooded again. The crowd got deeper as I walked towards the village, and I noticed that some people were crying, and many others were obviously distressed. When I got to the bottom of the hill, I realised that something was seriously wrong. I pushed my way through the crowd, trying to get to the front. I heard someone say that people were dead and that Mr Burgess from the pub was trapped inside. I will never forget what I saw next. It was the back end of a wagon sticking out from the front of Harry Wells corner shop on the crossroads. The wagon had careered down Burtby Lane into the shop front and what it had not demolished had collapsed onto the back of it. Teams of doctors and nurses were in attendance at the scene. A fleet of ambulances and fire appliances were also there. Three people were killed, including George Burgess, the licensee at the Punchbowl Hotel, someone I had known for many years. He was a highly respected local businessman and a valued member of the community. Seven others were treated for injuries of various degrees. I asked one of the senior officers if I could assist, even if it was just to do traffic control, but with the village teeming with police, I was not needed. The inquiry later revealed that the 16-ton wagon was overloaded, and as it travelled down the Burtby Lane Hill from Cleckheaton, its brakes failed. As it gathered speed, it had glanced off a mini-car and dragged another car over the traffic light it had demolished, and both vehicles crashed into the shop front. Rescuers, including some local people, worked with their bare hands to try and free the people trapped in the building, which was now almost completely demolished. The shop was eventually rebuilt many years later, with local people resentful that it took so long to sort out the legal insurance aspects of the incident. This ensured that the families of the dead and injured, and the local people, were constantly reminded of that tragic day in 1972. The first four weeks of my service in Bradford had been spent with a member of the traffic department. These officers were well trained and very experienced and being in a traffic car gave me the opportunity to deal with all kinds of road traffic-related incidents. I was taken on a measured mile test run a few times, when the vehicle was driven at some very high speeds. To me, as a non-driver, this was really scary stuff. I was glad to get back to working on the estate at Wyke, with both feet on the ground and dealing with things of a much slower pace. Control to 539, are you receiving? Receiving over. Neighbour dispute, St Mary's, will you attend? Yes, over. I arrived at a neat row of terrace bungalows on the estate and identified the one where the complainant lived. I knocked on the door. The door opened and there stood an elderly man holding a walking stick. What happened next was a completely new experience for me and one that stretched my tact, diplomacy and initiative to the limit. "'It's about time you got here,' he said. "'I've been waiting half an hour. Get in here now.' I went into his home, and I was about to sit down when I was verbally bombed by a tirade of shouting. "'Excuse me, why are you shouting at me?' I said in a quiet, unruffled voice. I saw this once on television, and it was a tactic that seemed to work when someone is shouting at you. It seemed to have a pacifying effect, because they expected you to reply in the same agitated tone. "'Because you're all bloody useless,' he said. "'I have never met you before, and I'm new to the area. "'I tried to calm him down, but he just went into a rant about local youth causing him grief. "'What's the problem?' I asked. "'It transpired that he had been pestered on a regular basis by some of the youths on the estate. "'They were knocking on his door, kicking a football against the gable end of his bungalow, "'and when he went out they called him names and swore at him.' He was obviously very worked up about it, and told me that he had to chase them away with his stick. Eventually, I managed to calm him down. For what information he could give me, he had no idea who the youths were. I explained that I would go and visit his neighbours to see if they knew any of the youths. I visited the five other bungalows in the row, and these were all occupied by widows. When I asked them about the problems, they all said, "'We don't have any problems.' At all. 
when these boys come round. We ask them to leave, and they go. No lip, no swearing, and off they go. They were adamant that it was the old man who was the problem. He was chasing the youths with his stick, and all they were doing was winding him up. This was going to need some delicate handling, otherwise I would end up being called back forever and a day to sort the problem out. I saw the old man standing on his doorstep waiting for me. "'So what are you going to do about it, then?' he asked. "'If you're the same as the rest and do nothing, I will complain about you as well.' "'Don't worry, sir. I understand exactly what the problem is now. "'I have a plan for what is obviously a very serious situation for you and your neighbours. "'So what are you going to do?' "'The CID. That's the answer.' "'This one comment stunned him into silence. "'Well, they should be able to sort it out.' He was now speechless, realising that I was taking his problem very seriously. Right, this is what is going to happen. I am going to get CID to do patrols around your home. You know they are already on the estate because of a few problems. Well, I heard about that. Now, what you must promise, I explained, is not to speak to the detectives. Don't even offer to make them a cup of tea. They will, of course, be in plain clothes, and they won't have a short haircut like me any more. As detectives, they have to melt into the community and become part of it to carry out their surveillance. Their plain clothes won't be a suit, either. They'll be wearing jeans and probably a bomber jacket. Do you know what a bomber jacket is? Oh, yes, my grandson has one. I won't say a word to them. No, you must not blow their cover. I'll fix this up with the detective chief superintendent, so it will start in a few days' time. Let's see how it goes. Thanks, B.C. Helm. You're the first policeman that's been and has done anything. I won't let you down. Several weeks later, I got a call. 539, the chief superintendent wants to see you now at his office. The chief superintendent was a softly spoken man, who I had met just the once when I started working at Odsall. I knocked and waited outside his office. No traffic lights here. Come in. P.C. Helm, sir, I've had a message to see you. Yes, sit down. I have received a letter about you. No, it's not a complaint. Listen to this. Dear sir, I would like to congratulate P.C. Helm, who works from the white section box, who has solved a long-standing problem for me with local youths around my bungalow on the St. Mary's estate. As you know, I have complained many times that your officers are hopeless and have previously done nothing. Here you have a fine officer who has been true to his word, and when he told me that he would sort this problem out once and for all, and he has done it. P.S. Would you also pass on my thanks to your CID officers, who have also carried out some wonderful work on this case? P.C. Helm, what can I say? This man has complained repeatedly about your colleagues down at White for having done nothing. You have obviously done a good job. Well done. Thank you, sir. Just one thing before you go. What has the CID got to do with it? Don't worry about it, sir. No problems. I couldn't believe it. I decided I must visit the old man to thank him for sending the letter into the boss. While many people find it easy to complain about the police, few ever take the trouble to write to say thank you for a job well done. This is not something you expect every day but it makes the job much more worthwhile, even if it only happens now and then. As I approached his house, I saw the old man standing in his doorway. He waved and invited me inside. Do you want a cup of tea, P.C. Helm? Yes, thank you. This was a big change from my first visit. There was no shouting this time. I've just called to say thank you for writing in. I have been to see the boss, and he is very pleased with the outcome. It's the least I could do. Would you like some cake, please? The CID were really good, and I mentioned them in the letter as well. Yes, the boss told me. I saw them, you know, all those young men walking past my house wearing jeans, and I saw some in bomber jackets, like you said. Some of them did have long hair as well. "'but I didn't speak to them and spoil it. "'I saw at least ten detectives a day past my house, "'all wearing jeans, "'and this was enough to keep the youths away from my bungalow. "'I can't thank you enough.' "'All part of the service,' I said. 
As I left his home, I turned around and saw all five widows looking out of their front room windows, waving and laughing. They all knew what I had told the old man I was going to do. The fact that he believed my story was sufficient for him to keep his word and not go out chasing the youths. This resolved the problem because a big part of it was, of course, him. This was a ploy that would work many times for me over the next thirty years. I often refer to it as the Ways and Means Act. It is often said there's no a queer as folk, and as a police officer I would see many more local characters over the years, all of whom wanted the police's help. I also heard that it was never recommended to work with children or animals. But as a police officer, you have to deal with everything and anything. This was one of those aspects of the job I enjoyed, dealing with the unexpected and not knowing what could happen next ensured that every day would be a challenge. There was one day, however, when children and one particular animal came together in what I can only describe as a miracle. In the early 1970s, there was no such thing as payment for working overtime. It was always time off in lieu. If you worked one hour over, you received an enhancement of 15 minutes. So when the sergeant asked me to work an extra hour each day for a whole week, meant the enhancement would almost give me a full extra day off. He didn't have to ask me twice and he told me to report to Otsal Police Station at 8am on Monday. While many of the lads liked working overtime at Bradford City football matches, rugby matches, the speedway at Bradford Northern, or even cricket matches at Park Avenue, I was not interested in sport. After working at Leeds United matches, if what went on both on and off the pitch was supposed to be the beautiful game, for me they could keep it. The opportunity to work at something other than a sports fixture was great. I would stick to watching the odd Big Cup match on the TV. I duly arrived at Odsall a little before eight and went to the sergeant's office. Right, PC Helm, he said, 8am to 5pm every day this week you are doing all four school crossings outside the Harrell Club on Huddersfield Road in Low Moor. He handed me the head-to-foot white umpire-style coat, a pair of yellow gloves and the stop sign. Oh, as it was often referred to, the lolly stick. I hated school crossing patrols, and he could probably read my mind at this point. Think about the overtime, he said. You had better get off or you'll be late. I could see the expression on his face as I left. He was almost laughing, but trying to make sure I didn't see him. Crossing patrols can be a major headache when some of the children try to run across the road or sneak behind you. The older children, or the know-alls as I often call them, love to shout your first name out if they manage to find out what it was. Hiya, Chris! As soon as one of them found out, they were all at it. It was surprising just how many mothers responded by telling their children to behave or else the policeman would take them away. I told quite a few of them off for that comment, because who did they expect their children to go to if they were lost? Surely not the policeman, because their mothers had told them he would take them away. Monday was a long day, but at least the weather was fine. Tuesday and Wednesday were very much the same. I spent lunch times between crossing duties in Lockwood and Hodgson's carpet shop, which was across the road from the crossing point. I had visited there many times before, and I was always given a warm welcome and a cup of tea. On a Saturday afternoon, May the 5th, 1973, it was here that the staff and I watched one of the most memorable cup finals ever. The game was between Leeds United and 2nd Division Sunderland. Who could ever forget Sunderland's Ian Porterfield scoring what turned out to be the winning goal after 31 minutes? or watching the manager, Bob Stoko running out onto the Wembley pitch after the final whistle went. Although I was not a football supporter, I was rather pleased Sunderland won that day. Thursday was not so good on the crossing, with drizzle for most of the day. 
you have to be careful when it is raining because you have to allow a greater stopping distance for traffic on the wet road surface and keep a close watch on the children. If anyone got knocked down, then it would be my fault. Friday was awful. The rain was coming down like stair rods and I was almost soaked through after the morning and lunchtime sessions. It was still pouring down when I was back on duty to see the younger children and their mothers across the road in the early afternoon session. I had to give even more time for traffic to slow down and stop. An accident was always possible in this weather. Making sure the children did not run across the road or try to sneak across behind me was a major concern. Suddenly... I heard the screeching of brakes behind me. Some of the children screamed and mothers gasped. My heart was in my mouth. Had a child been knocked down? As I turned to look, I saw it roll past me. The children and mothers watched it roll into the gutter, twitching as it lay there. It was not a pretty sight. It was a duck that had been hit by a car and catapulted across the road. The children were crying, and many of the mothers were upset. The driver got out of the car, apologising profusely. Not for hitting the duck, but for upsetting everybody. As the duck lay in the gutter twitching, children were asking if it was dead, and I tried my best to keep them calm. At this stage, I had not got a clue what to do. 539 to control. Go ahead. I'm at a school crossing point. I have a road accident involving a duck. 539 repeat. An accident involving a duck. Did you say duck? Yes, it's not dead, but it's a bit chaotic here and I need some assistance. Traffic will attend with the gas box. Can you ask them to be discreet? All the children, mothers and some passers-by are very distressed and crying. Received. It was a mile and a half away from Bolin Road, where the traffic department was based, and within minutes I could hear the sirens in Manchester Road. I saw the traffic car hurtling down Huddersfield Road from Odsall. Is this what they call being discreet? I thought to myself. The children were really upset now, and even more so once they could hear the police sirens getting nearer. The older children, the know-alls, were joining us, no doubt wondering what was going on. One of the boys approached the duck and kicked it, asking, Is it dead, Chris? The traffic car pulled up and the driver approached me. Almost in a slow motion, he took one look at the duck and gave it a kick. As the duck continued to twitch, he said, It's not dead, then. I explained that I did not know what to do, but he had the answer, the gas box. I never heard of that before. He took it out of the boot of the traffic car and put it on the boot lid, explaining that it was a means of euthanising small creatures in this situation. The children stood around, watching our every move. You lift the outer lid and the inner lid and place the creature inside. Then close the inner lid and take out the chloroform bottle from the drawer in the bottom. Sprinkle a few drops on the pad on the top of the inner lid, Close the outer lid, and that's it. In a matter of minutes, it will be dead. Make sure you seal the chloroform bottle, otherwise it will leak and you'll probably fall asleep while driving away. I went to pick up the duck from the gutter and went through the procedure very carefully, placing it inside the box, slamming the inner lid shut and sprinkling the chloroform drops. I then closed the outer lid and put the chloroform securely away. That's it. Now we wait. The children were still hanging round, watching with some asking if the duck had gone to heaven. Yes, I said. Don't worry. It's OK now. After about 15 minutes had elapsed, the traffic man said, I'm off now. I'll take it to the council yard. Don't worry, children, I said in a reassuring tone. It will have a nice funeral. Just before the traffic man left, I took another look at the box just to remind me how this neat little thing worked. Open the outer lid, take out the chloroform bottle, and then lift the... I had barely got a hold of the inner lid when it burst open and the duck flew off as if its life depended on it, which I suppose it did, 
Really? Bloody hell! The children all stood and watched as it flew away over the Haddle Club. PC Helm! Chris! they all shouted. What's happened? Don't worry, children, I said. That's what we call a miracle. After the excitement, they all began to walk away, clutching their mother's hands. No doubt what they saw that day outside the Haddle Club would stay with them. Well, at least for a few days. There were other opportunities for overtime, but I was determined not to volunteer for any sporting fixtures or fall for the same school crossing patrol overtime again. After a chance meeting with the duty sergeant, a new opportunity for overtime opened up and I took full advantage. This was working twice per week at St James's Wholesale Fruit and Veg Market, which was off Bowling Back Lane. Some years earlier there had been a robbery in the market and the authorities asked the police for some help to reduce the chances of it happening again. An arrangement was made that every Tuesday and Thursday from 7am to 10am Odsall Police Station would provide constables to provide additional security cover alongside the security man, Tom Eastwood, who was an elderly retired Bradford constable. While most other constables looked out for the sporting fixtures, five of us had the market overtime sewn up between us. This three-hour duty was considered to be boring, according to the other constables who were asked if they wanted a share of work in it, so it was left to the duty sergeant and his clerk to work out the overtime dates for us. Happily, this was to our benefit, and of course it ensured that they had the market covered for the required six hours a week. I first volunteered for the overtime in 1974, which is also the year that I got married at Zion Chapel in Hove Edge. Once I had worked at St James's for a few weeks, one of the traders reminded me not to forget to call in on Saturday for a parcel. A parcel? What on earth did he mean? I questioned him. It transpired that every Saturday morning the traders had to dispose of huge amounts of unsold fruit and vegetables, and they gave a lot of it away in parcels. I'm sorry, I said, but I can't accept it. Thank you. I tried to explain why it was not possible. Well, it's either you or the skip, he said, and then it's tipped. I then saw some more familiar faces— "'constables, inspectors, and even one or two more senior ranks. "'Well, if they accept it, so would I. "'I'll be down on Saturday morning. Thank you.' "'There was never any question of them asking me for any favours, "'and for the next two years I joined the queue "'and collected a parcel, a potato sack, many times. "'They couldn't bring the prices down, "'even though it may have meant they sold it all.' Giving as much away as possible ensured they maintained the wholesale price. What was not given away was thrown in the skip and then dumped somewhere. It came as a shock when I left Bradford, transferred to Brig House, and discovered just how much fruit and vegetables were now that I was having to buy them. All in a day's work. Thirty years as a local bobby. By Chris Helm. Chapter 8 Face to Face with a Wrestling Legend As a result of the 1972 Local Government Act, on April the 1st, 1974, the local police service has changed, with the amalgamation of Lee City Police, Bradford City Police and the West Yorkshire Police, which had itself been formed in 1968. The force was given the new name of West Yorkshire Metropolitan Police, with the headquarters located at Wakefield. In 1986, the word metropolitan was dropped from the name, when the metropolitan counties were abolished. Initially, being part of the new West Yorkshire Metropolitan Police meant nothing to Bobbies on the Beat down in Wyke and Low Moor, except I was now Police Constable 3539. This amalgamation was the change I was waiting for. Within a matter of days, I had typed out a report asking for a transfer to Brickhouse and placed it on the chief superintendent's desk. It was refused. I asked why, and the reason given was that Odsall was just as short-staffed as Brighouse was. But I was determined to persevere and try again later. 
A few months before the creation of the new force, I had applied to go on a four-week driving course. It was not so much that I wanted to drive police cars, but more that I could be taught to drive with the force paying. The salary for a serving police constable with less than four years' service was still not that good. The force agreed that I could get married and take on a mortgage of £88 per month to live in Bailiff Bridge. I needed to keep the small, and still secret, business that I had started in Leeds, selling towels, men's socks, and my big seller, ladies' tights, going a little bit longer. Selling five pairs for a pound and giving the seller a free pair brought me an avalanche of regular orders. I felt it was getting a bit close to home, so I decided that after giving it one last big push on sales, I would pack it in, once and for all. When the dates for my driving course came out, I paraded at Bollin Road and met the civilian driving instructor, Len Barry, for the first time. I also met the other two constables who were on the course with me. The three of us took it in turn learning to drive, and after a week Len asked us all where we would like to drive to. While the other two chose scenic journeys to York and Weatherby, I asked to go to Barnsley. Barnsley? asked Len. What on earth do you want to go there for? I want to call somewhere and collect a parcel if that's OK. When we got there, it resembled a dilapidated old lock-up shop with all the windows boarded up. I left the car and told them, I'll be back in a few minutes. What Len and the others did not know was that I had called for some of my last order of ladies' tights. With the boots stuffed with boxes and as many as we could get inside the car, the remainder of my last big order would be collected later. This was my last venture into the world of buying things wholesale. I passed the driving test, just, two marks less on the written test, and there would have been no pass slip for me. After a few months, I submitted my request again and just waited. After passing the driving test and still working out of white section box, there were four drivers covering the three basic shifts, and the fourth driver would cover for days off. When it was annual leave time, or officers had to attend court, one of the remaining foot patrol officers had to take on the car duty. My first outing as the Wyke and Lomoa beat car driver was not the best start I could have hoped for. I was picked up at 1.45pm by Gilbert Wakefield, who was the early turn driver. The tradition was that the 2.10pm driver took him home. Gilbert lived in a neat cul-de-sac of semi-detached properties on the Cleckheaton boundary. Thanks, Chris, he said. Good luck and be careful. Thanks, Gilbert. As I reversed, I suddenly felt a bump, and then the back end seemed to dip to one side. Gilbert came running round to have a look. Bloody hell, he said. You've run over the neighbour's kid's bike, and the wheel spindle has cut a hole in the tyre. This is when the Ways and Means Act came into play again, thanks to Gilbert. We took the wheel off and put the spare on. Now take it to Bollin Road Garage and tell them somebody put a lump of metal under the wheel. You might get away with it. Thankfully, I did. But I was glad when my shift was over and the all-night driver took over, dropping me off at home. Another day of being the 210 driver followed soon after and it turned out to be even worse than running over the kid's bike. The afternoon started off with the radio being fairly quiet. In fact, the only job I got in the first couple of hours was to deal with a complaint about a dangerous dog on 23 Beat, which was up in Buttershaw. On my way back to Law Moor and then into Wyke, I drove down Netherlands Avenue, intending to turn right and drive back to Wyke through Law Moor. I had to stop for traffic, indicating clearly and in good time to turn right, just as Len Barry had taught me. Setting off and still indicating, I suddenly heard a clash of metal from the rear of the police car. Before I had time to get out, I had an irate female standing outside my driver's door screaming at me about not indicating. As much as I tried to explain she was wrong, I knew this was trouble. 3539 to control. Go ahead.
Can you call the sergeant out? I have been involved in an RTA at Netherlands Avenue Junction. No one is injured. It seemed to take forever, but when the sergeant arrived, it was obvious it would be my word against the other driver. Her bumper had got caught in mine, and as I turned, both bumpers were partially ripped off. With the paperwork out of the way, I had to wait a few weeks before I would find out whether I was to be prosecuted. If I ever needed an angel of mercy, this was the time. Ten days after the accident, the angel appeared in the form of the district nurse. I met her while she was on her rounds. "'Was anyone hurt in the accident you were in, Chris?' she asked. "'No. What on earth was that woman doing? Didn't she see you indicating to turn?' "'Did you see what happened?' I asked. "'Of course. I was walking down Netherlands Avenue from a client's house and watched it happen.' "'You've made my day,' I said. "'Please contact Odsel and tell the sergeant what you saw.' She did, and there was no further action. The accident was the first part of what was a bad day. A few days earlier I had been at a training class at Bollin Road, and I was told all about the Haskem Code which involved the signs on wagons carrying hazardous chemicals. I have never forgotten the scary example the instructor gave us of what happened at an oleum chemical spillage from a crashed tanker. Following the accident, a passing driver stopped and ran through the rain and some liquid spillage on the road towards the trapped, injured wagon driver. This helpful Samaritan was engulfed by the oleum fumes almost straight away. This chemical includes sulfuric acid, but when it is added to water or rain, it forms a fine mist of corrosive acid. It is highly dangerous. The helpful passing driver never made it to the wagon driver. He died at the scene. The instructor pointed to this as an illustration of why you should always read the Haskem code on the vehicle before running to help. With that terrifying story still in my mind, later that evening, now in a replacement and undamaged beat car, I received a message to go to Allied Colloids Chemical Works in Cleckheaton Road. The message reported what was described as a small explosion and fire. On arrival at the works, it was obvious there was no fire and no fire engines either. As I got out of the car, I was in almost total darkness, with not a soul about. I began walking towards the factory. I soon became aware that my footsteps were getting heavier, and it was getting more difficult to walk the nearer I got to the factory buildings. From my torchlight, I could see that the ground was a creamy white colour, and that the substance, whatever it was, was sticking to my boots. The nearer I got to the building, the deeper the liquid became, until it was about an inch deep and covering my boots, up to about the third lace hole on my Doc Martins. The story we were told in the Haskem Code class came back to me. Were my boots melting? I couldn't smell anything. It was getting more and more difficult to lift my feet. It seemed as though I was walking in slow motion. Should I try to run out of it before my boots melted? I couldn't understand it. My feet weren't burning. If I lost my balance and fell over, would it melt me? Would I dissolve into the white creamy liquid and never be seen again? Officer, stay where you are, said a booming voice in the darkness. This is it, I thought. Am I going to die? It sounds daft, thinking about it now, but back then I thought my days were up. The voice came from one of the site safety officers, who told me, Walk slowly, it's quite safe. He was right. The slower I walked, the easier it was to walk out of the stuff. Once I was on dry land, well, the tarmac car park, I had to take my boots off and follow him. He took me to the factory stores. What size boots do you take? Ten. He gave me a brand new pair of boots to replace the ones covered in the white, creamy stuff. What was it? I never did find out, but I suffered no ill effects, and no, my feet didn't melt either. A few days later, the shift sergeant told me that he had read my report and had noted the damage to my boots, and to go to the stores in the city centre and get a replacement pair. 
I certainly wasn't going to argue with that. My efforts to transfer to Brick House had all but stalled. It is often said that it is not what you know, but who you know, and that was how my transfer to Brick House finally came to fruition. It was a chance meeting with an off-duty inspector outside the Brick House Co-op on King Street, which would put me firmly back on track. I met him standing outside the Co-op, wearing his half civvies, which means you could see his white officer's shirt and black tie under his civvy jacket. What really gave the show away was the standard police trousers and shiny black shoes he was wearing. After I'd introduced myself, this off-duty inspector told me that he had worked in Brighouse and Halifax for many years. The inspector was someone who I would get to know very well, and I would be grateful for his help in securing my transfer. I took the opportunity of telling him about my hopes of transferring to Brighouse something that had been an ambition of mine since I was a child. I explained that one transfer request had been already refused on the grounds that Odsell was equally as short-staffed. After listening to my story, he said the magic words, Leave it with me. I know someone who will help. It wasn't long before we met outside the co-op again. Contact the superintendent on this telephone number and tell him I have told you to ring. He is expecting your call. Explain to him you want to transfer to his division and be posted to Brick House. The advice did not stop at that. When he asks you why you want to transfer to Brick House, you must tell him that you have heard his division is the best. It can't fail. He was right. The superintendent was most impressed. You will start at Brick House next month, he said. Don't worry about when the general orders come out saying you will be transferring to Sobey Bridge. You'll be based at Brick House. That was it. A done deal. Mind you, the boss at Odsell was not too pleased. Working from 6pm to 2am was known in police circles as half nights. It was a strange shift, but it did mean you had all day off, which in later years, with a young family, made it my favourite shift. As we started work at tea time, as other people were coming home, then worked through to when people had not long gone to bed, it was often a quiet time in the early part of the week. Come the weekend and pub closing time, it all changed. Many consider that a good night out entails spilling out onto the streets after drinking more beer than was sensible, getting into a good fight and fish and chips to go home with. We almost prayed that PC Rain would make an appearance just before the pub's throwing out time. Nobody wanted to fight when it was chucking it down. It was on one of these half-nights that I met the licensee of the new inn in Wyke, taking his dog out for its late-night walk. I had seen him many times before. Not so much in the village, but on television, being introduced by Kent Walton on the Saturday afternoon wrestling programme. He was known to wrestling audiences as Crybaby Jim Brakes. We talked about his latest fights, and I asked him about his moves when he feigned that he was injured. It's all part of the show, was his reply. I took the opportunity to ask him about his special submission move, where he twisted his opponent's arm around and then folded their wrist up into their armpit, lifting them off the ground. This always brought an instant submission. The pain on the opponent's face was clearly visible as the pressure on his wrist became more excruciating. At least, this is how it appeared on television. Surely this was a fix, I suggested. He tried to convince me that it was for real. Hey, look, I'll show you. There we were at 1am, walking past the butcher's shop at the corner of Sadler Street and then standing outside the Babes in the Wood Caff in Huddersfield Road a place where I had some of the best Yorkshire pudding and sausage you could find for miles around. I was determined to get to the bottom of this hold Jim applied to his opponents. Was it a fix or not? Watching it on television, it seemed real enough. I took my cape off and hung it on a washing line, placed my helmet on a wall, and Jim tethered his dog to a gatepost. So let's have a go, I said. Surely it can't hurt. 
I can't imagine just what motorists were thinking when they drove past watching this small chap, one of the strongest you would ever meet, gripping a uniformed police officer in a wrestling hold. While Jim took me through it step by step, not one driver stopped to see if this police officer was in trouble and needed assistance. Within a matter of seconds of Jim putting the wrestling move on, I screamed out in pain. He let go immediately. What do you think? he asked. A fix or not? For the rest of my shift, my arm was in agony. The next time I saw Jim apply that special submission hold on the television, I knew exactly just how painful it was. The days dragged on as my transfer date gradually got nearer. I was still trying to keep a low profile and not to get involved in any work that would hang over the transfer date. The Wyke Police Section Box is in Huddersfield Road, next to the old Wyke Library. The police station was built as a single-storey building and has two internal halves. The front section was the office and the rest was where the snap room and the toilets were. One of the last jobs I had to deal with at Wyke happened one lunchtime when I was on my meal break. I was on my own except for Jim, one of the beat officers, who was in the front section catching up with his paperwork. I heard a gentle tapping. It sounded like it was at the front door. I expected Jim to answer it, but the tapping continued. I got up expecting him to have left, but he was on the telephone. Unlocking the door, I saw an elderly lady who appeared to be almost crying. She stood there in the pouring rain, carrying two large quop shopping bags, and she couldn't have been more than five feet tall. She was probably in her mid to late seventies and looked, dare I say, like a drowned rat, soaked to the skin, standing in the rain and obviously distressed. You had better come in and sit down, I said, taking the bags from her as she stepped into the office. PC Helm, you have to help me, she said. I tried to calm her down, thinking that this was at worst a mugging, her home had been broken into, or she had been having problems with local kids. I'll make you a cup of tea. As I brought the tea in for her, Jim had finished on the telephone. I asked him to deal with her as I was having my dinner. Sure, Jim said. No problems. I left it to them. After my meal break, I returned to the office, and Jim and the old lady had left. As the days and weeks went by, I continued to keep a low profile until the big day came and I could finally get to Brig House. I was sat in the station tying up some loose ends with some outstanding paperwork when there was a knock at the door. Opening it, I was faced with an elderly lady carrying two quap shopping bags. P.C. Helm, she said. I'm glad I have found you in. Please, can you help me? She was obviously very upset, and from her tone and manner I could see she was desperate. Something was seriously wrong. Are you the lady who called a few weeks ago and my colleague Jim helped you? Yes, she replied, becoming agitated, but he was useless. Some of my friends live on St Mary's estate, and they told me you helped one of their neighbours. You will remember him, an old chap who had problems with local youths. They say you are the policeman who knows everybody and can always help. Well, I need your help. After settling down with her cup of tea, she told me that she lived on the bottom side of Wyke, where one side of the road is higher than the other. This meant that when she got home from shopping and sat down in her front room with a TV meal on her knee, she could see across the road and down into the front room of the house opposite. A lot of my friends have died, she said, and some young people have moved into the street, including my friend's house opposite mine. But what is the problem? Well, I'm sorry, she said, but it's embarrassing. You see, when I sit having my tea watching Crossroads, I can see straight down to the front room of the house on the opposite side of the road. I could see she was uncomfortable. Go on, what is the problem? She went into fairly graphic details without actually saying the words. You see, it's the young, newly married couple. Getting increasingly uncomfortable, she continued... I can see them in their lounge in the front of the gas fire, sometimes with no clothes on, and you know they are being 
passionate sometimes. Oh, dear, I said. I'm sorry to hear about this, but have you considered drawing your front room curtains? That lit the blue touch paper. Close my curtains, P.C. Helm. Why can't they close their curtains? I'm seventy-eight years old, you know, and I shouldn't have to watch that whilst I'm having my tea, should I? No, of course not. Was this the problem you raised with my colleague Jim a few weeks ago? Don't talk to me about him. He's useless. He has done nothing, not a thing about it. I'm surprised to hear that, I said, because I know he is very conscientious. You're telling me he has done nothing at all about it? Well, he came down to my house. I even made him a cup of tea. I explained all about it, pointed out the house and window, and do you know what he said? I shook my head, and before I could speak, she said, he said he would have to come and do some observations, and do you know he has been lying on the top of my Grimston garage roof a few days at a time, and that has now been almost four weeks. I was left speechless, and do you know, she continued, I have even provided him with cups of tea and sandwiches while he did the observations. It was obviously time for some creative policing once again, and after I went to see the young couple, the problem stopped. I never heard from the old lady again. I left Jim a discreet little note to say the problem was now resolved. It sometimes proved difficult trying to remain professional all the time and keeping a straight face. I never realised when I joined the modern police service that I would ever be called to deal with those kind of problems. When my transfer finally came through, over the next 26 years, working in my hometown of Brickhouse, I would not only be called on to deal with many serious incidents, but also many more jobs that would tax my imagination as a police officer. These kind of jobs were what the old-time bobbies had to deal with every day. Call me old-fashioned, but I was determined to try and bring back some of those values, policing methods and attitudes. I wanted to help local people to deal with some of the social injustices and to speak up for those who would normally be ignored by the authorities. Local people may have lost contact with their local police, but I was going to try and make sure that they would at least always know me. I remembered the words of my class instructor at the end of my four-week continuation course at the Dishforth Police Training Centre. Whilst I doubt whether you will ever be anything other than a police constable, I will say that if I lived on your patch and I needed help, I know I could count on you. Whatever it took to resolve the problem, you'll be there for those that needed help.